Good morning. And welcome to First Church Congregational. I'm so glad you're here today. I'm Bill Ingraham. I'm the senior pastor. And on behalf of all of our members and friends, welcome to the service. People who are online, thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you can be with us. I um, hope that you'll take a moment to check in, just post a little note saying that you're there so you can build community among those who are watching online. Um, and know that we're really glad that you're part of our service today. So we like to offer a gift to first-time visitors. And I know of one person here today um, for the first time. We have a coffee mug. Just you can have a cup of coffee on us. Um, and so I'll ask if a deacon could bring that forward. Uh, if you'd raise your hand just so they can see you right here, right behind the Boycos. Is there anybody else here for the first time today? Okay, great. Thank you so much for being here. We're so glad of all the places you could have gone today, you came here. So welcome. Um, okay, so I don't have many announcements today. This is the uh, last Sunday of the month, and so this next week is the week we don't have meetings. It's kind of a lovely little week at First Church. I know it makes everybody sad not to have a church meeting to come to. Um, but just so you know, I had announced this last week. Um, my office hours are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays in the morning. And then um, something I'm adding new this year, a half hour before evening meetings. And as I said last week, I'm not going to be here setting up for your meeting. I'll be in my office in case somebody wants to talk to me. So um, those are office hours as printed in the bulletin. And of course, other times by appointment. And remember, you can always call the church phone anytime, day or night. And they know how to escalate getting the message to me, whether it's a text message, a phone call, or even sending your call through. Um, they know how to handle that. So call the church number anytime, day or night. Um, you see uh, this um, display off to the left here at the front of the church, the YMCA closed drive that we're having with the outreach ministry team. That officially starts today. It goes through the first Sunday of October. The sizes are listed in the bulletin. This is for the uh, My Kids Clothes Closet at the Methuen branch of the Merrimack Valley YMCA. They take... Um, of course, if you want to get new clothes in those sizes, that's great. But used clothes in those sizes, we ask um, clean, not stained, not damaged. Um, and we're going to be collecting those for a month. I'm really excited to add this to the many things we do in outreach in the community. That will touch a whole lot of families. Also, so you know, Chapel School is getting closer to being open. Oh, yes, Carol? Yeah, the sizes are in the bulletin. She's wanting to emphasize 2T to men's and women's small and medium. And that's listed in the bulletin. It'll be in the newsletter. Um, we're going we're gonna to bring that message home um, between now and, and later. So thank you, Carol. Thank you. And um, he has a name, John. Thank you, Carol and John. Um, appreciate it. So Chapel School getting really close. Their teachers meeting will be on Monday. The teachers have come in last week, some to be working on their rooms. Um, we have at this point, I think, 85 kids enrolled, maybe 86. So we're almost full. Um, that's more kids than we had at the end of the year last year. We're really excited. Gina Calaruso, the woman who will succeed Cindy as the director of school has been tag teaming with Cindy for a couple of weeks now and is getting ready we sent out the letter two letters to parent families this week a letter from Cindy announcing her retirement a letter from me announcing, announcing Gina those went into the mail on Thursday afternoon also they got interviewed by the um, Eagle Tribune I don't subscribe to that paper, so I don't know if the article has hit yet, but I know the reporter came Friday and interviewed um, Cindy and Gina, so watch for that too. It's an exciting year. Yes, Marilyn. Oh, also interviewed by Methuen Life, that's right. Um, so be watch, watching for Methuen Life. The next issue is going to have several things from us, so um, watch for that. Okay, other announcements today. Just know that the food pantry is going strong. Um, we're averaging close to 400 families, sometimes over, not this week, but last week we actually ran out of food the first time in a while that's happened. So the demand continues to be high. It's really important that we partner with neighbors in need to keep that project going every single week. Um, we're meeting a lot of needs in our community. So any other announcements I've missed today? So joys and concerns, good news, I was able to get a hold of Nick Platt. You may recall before I left, Nick was really not in good shape. We were really concerned. He was feeling so, Nick very much as an extrovert and always glad to have somebody come and visit 
Um, he asked me not to come. He wasn't feeling well. I mailed him a prayer shawl because um, he just didn't want company. So I called him this week, got his voicemail, and knew as sick as he was. I was worried that was a bad sign, but I left a message um, and was really quite concerned. Well, two hours later, he called me. Oh, so sorry, Pastor. I was in a treatment this morning when you called. I'm doing great. So much better than I was. Thanks so much. I'm planning to come to church sometime in September. Gail and I have decided that'll be my first outing. He is doing so much better. So it, it just did my heart good. Um, Nick, if you're watching today, we're praying for you. We love you. We're so glad you're doing better. Can't wait till we see you here. Um, and then two um, serious concerns. One is Keith Victor. Um, he has been here before to worship. That is Stacy Murray's father. Um, he had a major um, brain aneurysm and stroke this last week. Got flown from the hospital in Newton the Mass General, um, they're really concerned. They're not, they're not sure that he's going to have the capacity to pull through this. All the family is together. They're being supportive of one another. I'm checking in with Stacy regularly. So keep Stacy, all of her family, her husband John, their two girls, keep all of them in your prayers. And then Josh Ferry's not here today. He has gone back to Michigan. His father um, has been on hospice and seems to be in a tenuous place, and so Josh has gone home. Um, we keep Mason Ferry in our prayers. That's Josh's. I always hear about Josh's dad. I don't think I knew that his name is Mason. And so today we're also praying for Mason Ferry. Those are the joys and concerns I have for today. I'm sure there are others that we bring in our hearts, both joyful things and things about which we have great concern. We trust those to God's care, and we'll offer them to prayer a little later in the service. I'm going to go sit down while we bring in the light of Christ. Let us begin our worship together. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Here we are, gathered once more in this place of worship and praise. We are here to offer prayers and praise to the God of heaven and earth. In sorrow or joy, or days of trouble or triumph, we seek God's presence here. Listen now for words of hope that ground our lives in the ways of heaven. We draw upon our ancestors' faith, trusting God's promises to us and to all.
Please join me in the morning prayer. Our gracious heavenly God, we give you thanks for this day. From generation to generation, your love is boundless and your compassion is sure. You've led your people through desert places and helped our forebears to trust good news in the most difficult of days. Help us to live with a sense of your presence, whatever might come our way, and to sing your praises for all the days of our lives until your kingdom comes and your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated, and I invite children who might like to come forward for a moment up here with me. Looks like it's just going to be the two of you as I see somebody in the back going, nope, I'm not coming, which is just fine. So good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. How's your summer been? Lots of horses this summer? It's good. And, had, and lots of fun days? Has it been good? So when does school start back? Mr. Pillow in the face. Is it this week or next week? This week. Wow, that's Wednesday. That's really quick. Well, I hope it goes well. And so what grade are you going into, Henry? Third grade. And Haley? Seventh. What grade are you going into way back there? Five, six, seven. Okay, thank you. I, could, I, had, to, I, had, to, I had to count the fingers. I had to add the two. <laughs> um, okay, well, so... My sermon today is about never-ending deliverance. I don't know if deliverance is a term. What do you think deliverance is? Any idea? It's kind of a crazy word. Oh, aren't you good? You guys are always so good. So she said, maybe it's like delivering good and getting rid of evil. There you go. Will the ushers come forward and receive the offering? It's not, it's not going to get any better. Yeah, it is bringing good and taking away evil. There's also a part of it that recognizes that when we're in a bad time or maybe um, in a bad place, it might be bad as in we're worried or scared. It might be bad as in we're overwhelmed and can't do it. It might be bad as in we're hungry. It might be bad as in, I mean, it could be all sorts of different things. Um, it is a sense. So deliverance also has in it a sense of rescue of somebody coming to help. So not long ago, I was feeling um, kind of sick and I didn't tell folks I was feeling sick. And I, well, I'll even say what it was. It was the day of the um, man back to school project. And I just wasn't feeling very well. Um, and so I walked down the hill, which is what I do every year when we have the Man Back to School Project. I walked down the hill from the parsonage and through the neighborhood over to the Tenney Street Park, which is where we have it. And I was helping with it outside. And although there were so many volunteers, everybody was doing such good work, I mostly just sat there and looked pretty, which is one of the things I do best. Um, and I finally decided, you know what? I'm not feeling very well. I'm tired. I'm just going to go home. I think it was like Jet lag was part of what was going on that day for sure. And so I said goodbye to everybody and I started walking home and I walked, instead of going backwards over to like Lawrence Street and coming back that way, I walked up the other way and I was coming up Broadway. And so I passed the um, river there and I went into CVS and got some medicine to help me feel better. And then as I was walking up, I thought, I'm not gonna make it up the hill. 
I'm just, I don't feel very well. And so at that moment, a good friend of mine, um, known to you as some of you as Pastor Lauren, who happens to be sitting here today, um, called me on the phone to see how I was doing and seeing if she could just come over and um, meet me at the Man Project. I said, actually, I don't feel very well. Could you rescue me? Could you pick me up? She said, sure. And so she had been at the post office. She just drove around and picked me up and drove me up to the house. And I went right inside, took up my shoes, and laid down on the couch and took a nap. Um, and I felt better after the nap. So in that moment, when I wasn't feeling well and I was tired and I could have made it up that hill, but it really seemed miserable, Lauren came and delivered me. And I really think in those moments, when we're there at the right time and in the right place, we, we act on God's behalf to try to do good, to help someone else. Lauren um, acted in love on God's behalf to take care of me in a moment that I needed it. So um, we think of God as one who will deliver us, bring good, and take away the evil or the trouble, but also that you can actually count on, that I can actually count on, that all of you can actually count on to help us when the times are rough and to see us through. Even when we don't know exactly how we're going to make it, we try to learn to trust God to come and see us through. So thank you very much. It's good to see you again. I hope school goes well. And we're going to say a repeat after me prayer, everybody, if you would. Let's pray together. Dear God, you are there for us. And we thank you. Help us to trust you and call on you for help. Amen. Thank you so much. We come now to our time of prayer together. I invite you please to join me as we pray. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, O God, as we offer them to you in this special place, this holy ground, this room in which we have worshipped, some of us for years, some of us for the first time or second time. This place where generation after generation people have come to offer you their prayers and listen, hopefully, for a word that could inspire and find a sense of divine love and compassion that would see them through and see us through. And so we gather here today and we offer you our prayers and we offer you our praise. We do bring with us our burdens, the concerns that can become heavy and difficult to bear, whether they are things about which we are worried in our lives, be it health or emotional or work-related or family or friends or politics or employment, whatever, whatever it might be, we bring our concerns to this place and we lay them before you and offer you these burdens from our hearts and our lives and trust your love and compassion to hold us and to see us through. Specifically, we pray for those who need healing, some of whom we have mentioned in this hour. We pray for doctors and physician's assistants and nurses and all those who are working to bring medical healing. We pray for people, too, who are recovering, whether it's recovering from surgery or recovering with medication or dealing with long-term illnesses or conditions or chronic um, conditions. We lift all these people to you and trust your healing power. Help us to, to be wise, to seek medical help where we are able and to stay dedicated to the course of healing and do what we can do to make that work. We ask your blessing. We ask for healing. We are aware too of mental and emotional health and the illness that can accompany some of our days and we offer our prayers for healing in that way too. Grateful for therapists and medications and all the ways we try to find um, wholeness, 
mentally and emotionally. Help us to be a community where we are not afraid to talk about mental health and where we offer one another support and strength as each of us strives to be healthy in body, mind, and spirit. And two, we are aware of um, substance use disorders and people with all different expressions of addictions from um, chemical to activities, whatever they might be. We pray for healing. We give you thanks for 12-step programs and the chance to seek sobriety. We ask you to help us to support one another, whether we are family and friends or the people themselves living with um, any expression of addiction. Help us to find our way. Help us to reach out to you, our higher power. Help us to work the steps and try to as best we can, live through the moment, trusting the future to you. And we pray for this church, grateful, grateful that we have this place to worship you, grateful for our relationships one with another, grateful for all the service we do in the community, the many things, old things we've done for years, new things we are beginning now, things we no longer do, things we have yet to discover we need to do. Help us to be of service in this town, on this hill, through this region, making a difference for lives in this world, both among our members and in the community at large. We pray for the world, too, in an environment that rages in so many ways and days that seem very different and even uncertain. In the struggles around politics and what is truth and what is not, and our striving to be a country that embraces equality, yet the many different prejudices that hold us apart and keep us from true unity in a world that so much needs peace. We pray for all these things, trusting your love and compassion to hold us, to give us strength, to offer us healing, and empower us to live our days this day and always, proclaiming your love in our lives and the world. And now we pause to offer silent prayers. Hear these prayers we offer in our hearts in the name of Christ. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus as we say together the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We do not worship God without taking a moment to offer our gifts. Tithes and gifts that we offer to do God's work here in this church and throughout the world. Some of us place a check or cash in the offering plate every week. Some of us, um, like me, give electronically once a month. Others mail in checks. There's all sorts of ways that people give to this church and to other organizations. To me, the most important thing is that as we offer our gifts, we have the intention that they go to serve God and this church and the community in all the ways God would have us do. And also, that all that we keep, we would use in ways that brings God honor. Now we pause and receive our morning offering.
We thank you, God, for the blessings you shower upon us and the chance we have to share some of what you've given for your service in this church and the world. Bless these gifts, we pray, and bless us too, that all we have will be used in ways that bring you honor. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah, chapter 51, verse 1 through 6, which can be found on page 594 in your pew Bible. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath for the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. May the living word of God speak to us through these ancient words of Scripture. it off. I did. There we go. Um, I'm out of practice with the switch on the microphone. I should just trust them back there. I wanted to, this is really off topic, but you've heard the, they're having a rough day. Get it, get it, rough day. Um, I used to serve a church. It was early on. I was still in the seminary and it was right by a railroad track and there were trains that went by during the service. And so when they did, Everything just stopped and we waited. If we were singing a hymn, it was okay. But if I was preaching or saying a prayer, you just had to stop. Because not only was there the boom, 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 boom. There was also the um, Anyway, the dogs reminded me of that this morning. Um, so this passage from Isaiah. Remember, I, always, I love to talk about Isaiah. I love Isaiah. It really is an exciting um, book to me. It's divided into three parts. It's not perfectly divided into three parts, but there's 1st Isaiah chapters 1 through 39. There's 2nd Isaiah chapter 40 through 55. And 3rd Isaiah chapter 56 through um, 65. That's the general divisions of the book of Isaiah. And they deal with three specific moments of time for um, our ancient um, Jewish forebearers. So the first one, um, and in fact, Pastor Lauren preached about, well, she touched on King Uzziah. Um, The year that King Uzziah died, that's first Isaiah. That's kind of the start of Isaiah the prophet's work as he is speaking words of warning um, to his people because they have not been true to what God called them to do. There was an agreement. God would be their God. They would be God's people. And they were to live um, the law and obey who, what God had called them to do, it, to be whom God had called them to be, and they were not doing it. And so First Isaiah, um, for 39 chapters, gives resounding warnings about what is going to happen if they do not live up to... Um, what is supposed to be their identity as a people, being God's people. And and sure enough, the invading armies come, uh, the temple is destroyed, a lot of people are killed, um, and others are hauled off 
um, in chains and captivity to Babylon. And that is where 2nd Isaiah does his work. 2nd Isaiah is speaking to a people, um, by the time they come back, the next generation and the next generation, people who are in captivity, whose understanding of themselves has been in relationship to God in a land with a temple. And so when your relationship to the divine is based on a geographical place and specifically a house of worship, um, and that is taken away from you, destroyed, or worse than taken away from you, destroyed, and you were taken away from it, Second Isaiah speaks to those people to say, there is hope. You will be restored. And then third Isaiah, um, when the people have um, gained their freedom, and we would assume most of them, some people perhaps, they chose to stay in Babylon. They had a pretty good life. They had come up with a convenience store that they run or whatever. Um, but most of the people wanted to come back to their land. And so they come back and the temple is still destroyed. The city is still in ruins. Um, there are people that have been there while they were gone who are saying, who are you? Why are you back? Um, and they're in the place of restoring and rebuilding. That's the message that third Isaiah has. You're going to prosper in this place. Well, this is, this is second Isaiah. But this passage, actually, it's... Um, I mean, so it is, it is speaking to this people in this time when they are uh, away from their home and trying to maintain a sense of their identity and have hope when they feel absolutely um, hopeless and helpless. But it is a message that resounds with us whenever we sit in that broken place, that place of despair and uncertainty, that place of heartbreak, that place of fear. When I was talking to the kids about the hard time. That's really what this passage is about. And there are lots of ways we can relate to it. So uh, we can relate to it when we've had particularly difficult physical things that we are facing or a loved one is facing. We can relate to it when there's a big challenge ahead of us and we really don't want to see it. Um, we can relate to it remembering as well we do the pandemic and especially the early days when we had no idea how we ever would find our way out of that. Remember when, when we first closed for the pandemic, it was in March, and we thought, oh yeah, we'll be back by Easter. <laughs> it was no, we were not back by Easter, and it was hard and it was long. And this church, we remade ourselves online, then little ways we could be in touch until finally we were able to come back and be together again. We're still in that process of rebuilding and coming back. It's a long process. We're doing well. We really are doing well, but it's a long process. So we can remember the hardest times of the pandemic, and we can remember that difficulty. Um, and even um, those who have been here a long time, although this is a great crowd today for a summer Sunday. This is really good. Um, and especially those of us that remember uh, right after the pandemic when we'd have 16 people and say, hey, 16 people. <laughs> um, but, you know, all over the church, people are remembering when there were hundreds of people, where now there are dozens and dozens of people. And so we, it's easy for us pretty quickly to get into a place of worry, or doubt, or despair. This passage is all about reminding us that it is God who will see us through. God's promises are true, and we will find our way. If you think about it, all those things I've just named, the pandemic, physical difficulties, emotional difficulties, job difficulties, all those things that we have gotten through and survived would be, you would think, a case study to us to remind us, ah, I can get through the hard things. We can get through the hard things. We can accomplish much as a church. We can. We can come, on, uh, come up with new things and implement them, which we have one of them right now, starting right here, a clothing drive. Yet a, we're always looking for new ways to make a difference in the community. Yet one more thing. It's easy to get in that negative place and forget both the ways God has gotten us through and how much we can cling to those promises. Now, I don't want to um, lay on any sort of guilt that you or I 
or we are particular in that capacity to be kind of lost in despair in the present moment, whatever it is. I think that's very much a human reality and something that we have to try to learn time and again um, to overcome. We learn faithfulness. We learn to be hopeful when hope seems um, scarce. We learn to trust in God for strength when we are feeling the weakest. That's why in this passage, Isaiah reminds the people of um, Abraham and of Sarah. He said, cling to the rock from which you were hewn. So Abraham and Sarah, uh, they used to be Abram and Sarai, um, desert wanderers. Um, Abram um, had an encounter with God and God said to him, your descendants will be great more numerous than the stars in the heavens or the sands in the ocean, your um, descendants are going to be that great. Yet he and his wife, both at old age, had no children. You remember the story of Isaac and when he was born, Sarah, um, nearly 100 years old, barren, had not had children. Um, Abraham and Isaac living with God's promise that they're, um, they would be the start of a great and glorious nation even though their time is ticking and they're getting older. Um, these three strangers come and Abraham welcomes them into their home and Sarah fixes food for them. And they say to Abraham, when we come back next year, your wife will be with child. And Sarah, who either was intentionally eavesdropping or could just happen to hear from the kitchen. You know, a well-placed kitchen. You can, you can hear what's going on in the living room. Sarah heard them say that when they came back next year, she would be with child, and she couldn't help herself. She laughed out loud. It seemed such an absurd thing. Um, well, the name Isaac, the child they did have, means laughter. And in fact, where she had thought for sure she never would be able to have her dream of having a child, she did. And in fact, Abraham and Sarah did become the forebears of a great nation. Isaiah says to the people in exile, the people of broken hearts, to the people of medical or emotional trauma, the people who cannot find a way out, the people like us, from time to time, who simply cannot hear anything over the cry of our own sadness and worry and doubt. Second Isaiah says, remember, those who have been the most hopeless have had hope. And those to whom God has made promises, those promises come true. Not like a wish made true, but God fulfills promises to deliver God's people. And Isaiah goes on to say, this desert place, this de and in this way, it's a real physical desert, but um, this desert place, emotional desert, spiritual desert, whatever it might be, medical desert, this desert place, the rains are going to come, it's going to bloom, and it's going to be remarkable. There is hope. So, you know, for a while I lived in New Mexico. I was up um, at the base of Sandia Crest, the highest mountain in that part of the state. And it was desert. It was high desert. And so my front lawn was dirt. And I was so happy because I didn't want to mow a lawn. And my lawn was dirt. You don't have to mow dirt. And the driveway faced that, that way. So when the snow came, it would all be melted by the end of the day. I didn't have to shovel. I was in heaven. Um, but I learned something in the desert. This barren land just sits there and then the monsoon rains come and water the earth and things you did not even know were under the ground begin to sprout and come up. My great surprise, the first day I walked out, about two, three weeks into the summer monsoons and in Albuquerque at that time it would mean it was blue sky in the morning, clouds start to come around noontime. About four o'clock in the afternoon, there'd be scattered showers. And by scattered showers, I mean literally, there's a shower, there's a shower, there's a shower. But in time, everywhere gets water. And a few weeks in, I walked out my front door and I looked at my yard and it was a carpet of green. And I, and I got down and I looked even closer and there were little yellow and white flowers. There, were, there was some plant 
dormant in the soil of my yard, the roots holding the dirt so it didn't wash away when the rains came, just waiting, dormant. I'd been there for months. But when the right amount of moisture came, it turned green and yellow and white. It was beautiful. This passage is a promise. That no matter how hard our days might be, there is waiting for us God's own springtime blooming. <laughs> there is waiting for us a sense of blessing that can help us realize the time of despair is past, or at least that we have made it through and will live um, to love and laugh another day. There is the promise, whether it's in this life or the life to come, in the moment of our days on earth or in the broad sweep of history, that in the end, God's kingdom will come. God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is no moment in our lives when God is not present with us. There is no despair through which God does not offer us hope and help. The trick is to learn to teach ourselves to trust that the good news is true, that love really does exist abundantly and that um, compassion really is the core of God's identity. And through it all, we are held and empowered to live and love and serve. Please pray with me. Loving God, we give you thanks for holding us all our days. And we ask you, when we find ourselves in the desert places, when there is a drought of hope and love and joy and strength, that you would help us to place our trust in you, that you have our back, that you hold us and care for us and will help us to find a way through. Help us to have faith that your love and compassion will always be sufficient for us. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.
Hear now the benediction. Go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do, trusting God's love and compassion to hold you now and always. May the peace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.